These are some of the most annoying people ever caught on TCAP. <laughs> you think this is funny? No, it's a big joke. And this piece of work didn't even have a shred of dignity. And let's start with this guy here, who thought he was being a smartass until he got that ass of his busted. Well, this dude right here thought he had a way with words, but you know, we all think we're better at things than we really are sometimes, huh? And things weren't any different for Indrajit Singh. Many of these guys have an instant change in terms of the look on their face once I walk into the room. You see, you right off the bat, when Chris asked him for his name, dude came up with a shocking response. Andy. Andy? And how old are you, Andy? I'm uh, 23. Oh yeah, lying came as naturally as breathing for this guy. It didn't even take him a second to come up with an alias on the spot. Despite being aware of exactly who he was dealing with, Chris continued to hammer him with questions just to see how far he was willing to take things. And he wasn't disappointed, that's for sure. When asked to explain why he was in the sting house in the first place, dude made it crystal clear that he was allergic to anything remotely connected to being accountable. He started spinning even more lies, which is why, after that fake name, he came up with a fake excuse too. Because she told me to come over so we can watch a movie or something. You can watch a movie or something. Okay, so what kind of movie are we really talking about here, huh? I mean, why would you feel the need to fake your identity when the initial plan is just to hang out and watch a movie? Actually, scratch that. I don't think I want to know. At this point, it was safe to say dude was trying every trick in the book and just figuring it out as he went along. You can you can talk, you can you can you can converse, but it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. But what he said next was absolutely ridiculous. Well, uh, I'm pretty much into academics, so. Oh really? For someone who is into academics, I don't think that was a really smart move to make. But what gets me is that grin he had plastered on his face at all times. Well, of course, he was arrested and transported to the nearest police station, but did you know that he actually filed an appeal arguing that the court had insufficient evidence against him? So I guess he wasn't lying about at least one thing, since he did have some knowledge about the law. But instead of using that knowledge to fight his case, he should have used it to stay out of trouble in the first place. Now, if you you're the type of guy who finds himself on TCAP, you've gotta be at least some level of disgusting. But some of these guys take it to new heights. And one that really got under my skin was this clown right here. I honestly find it disturbing how, despite dealing with a disability, he pushed through not to, you know, try and live a more fulfilling life, but rather get involved in some really disgusting stuff. Now, in his early 40s, Jose Falcon embarked on a rather unsettling online journey that eventually led to a pretty shocking confrontation with the TCAP crew. Falcon began his conversation with the setup with a ton of lies, including claiming to be 20 years younger than he actually was, and adopting the alias Pepe. And by the way, English wasn't his native language, and this language barrier made his communication with the setup pretty challenging. But our man here wasn't gonna let his disability stop him, so something as small as a language barrier was pretty much nothing to him. Still, his messages made so little sense that deciphering their meaning was a feat in itself. Like, take a look at this. Did you find me profile? I like you. Nice pretty. Nice girl. Do you want to address? Oh, wait, did he mean undress or was he trying to figure out where she lived? These are the kind of questions that keep me up at night. Anyway, despite the language barrier, Falcon's intentions were painfully clear. At one point, she tried to make a voice verification call to confirm his identity. But Falcon hesitated and stuck to text messaging or communication through a text telephone, a type of accessibility tool. The setup skepticism forced her to make a conventional phone call to Falcon, but the call was met with silence on his end, something that would make a whole lot more sense later. Meanwhile, Falcon embarked on a two and a half hour drive from Miami to Fort Myers, where he expected to meet his dream date. Once there, the setup tried to contact him four times before having to actually go outside to invite him in. I mean, she was literally laying out the red carpet for him. Hey, Pepe, I'm in here. Do it again. Hey, Pepe, come on in. 
But once Falcon took the bait, guess who was there waiting for him? Chris tried his best to maintain a composed atmosphere and even offered Falcon a seat. But Falcon responded with some strange grunting noises, possibly trying to signal something. And when she does, I come out. Mark, please have a seat right here. No, 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 no. I... Oh yeah, he was completely deaf, which explains why he couldn't communicate properly. Chris tried to convince Falcon to stay, but Falcon was in no mood to comply. Oh, it's okay. Can you read something? And then heads for the door. Right outside, the cops who'd been waiting for his exit confronted him, ordering him to get on the ground. However, due to his hearing impairment, that obviously didn't get them anywhere, leading the officers to physically apprehend him. Looks like this guy's deaf, guys. Get down! Get down! Now, I've got all sorts of problems with how the officers conducted themselves here, but what's done is done, and Jose Falcon found himself facing obscene communication charges. Despite the serious allegations, though, he was released on bail just a day after his arrest. Falcon eventually pled guilty, leading to a nine-month prison sentence and a three-year registration as an offender. Remarkably, Falcon's status as a registered offender in Florida persists to this day long after the initial three-year figure. Maybe the initial registration was extended to a lifetime or his request to be removed after those three years was denied. Or maybe he never made such a petition in the first place. Again, these things keep me up at night. What's more, he later got married and continues to reside in Florida. Well, at least he found his people, and I hope that's enough to stop him from committing the same offense again. For his sake, and Florida's. But this next dude had the audacity to laugh in Chris's face. That's right, I'm talking about John Wesley Elliott. John Elliott, a factory worker for a window company. He's driven two and a half hours. To and this dude was just completely insane. Yeah, don't think sliding into the setup's DMs is appropriate, dude. But he saw nothing wrong with it. In fact, he took things one step further and talked about exactly how he felt just by chatting without any clothes on. And, oh, by the way, did you see what he called himself? He went by Bald Beaver Hunter. I'm not even going to do him the service of getting into that. But when Chris asked him about it, you won't believe how he reacted. <laughs> you think this is funny? No, I'm it's just... a big joke. Chris was visibly taken aback. I mean, it sounds like everything was just a big joke to him. It was then that Chris decided to lay down the law and explain to him the consequences of what he was doing. And for a moment, it looked like old Beaver Boy over here couldn't understand what was happening around him. When Chris realized that the dude was probably daydreaming, he decided to shoot him a question. Chris wanted to test if Wesley understood the gravity of the situation. And so he asked him what should happen to him next. And his reply was something else. What do you think should happen to you? Sent to an island? <laughs> Sent to an island. <laughs> <Exile? think> it, <laughs> this prick really thought he was in on a big prank. I mean, who talks like that? He probably thought he'd just be given a warning or something. In fact, he assumed Chris was a therapist and started this huge rant about the mental issues he was facing. But what gets me is that even after the whole shit show he put on, at the end of it, all he had to say was this. You know, I love my wife, and I know it doesn't look like it. Yeah, try saying that to her face now, prick. Now wait till you hear what this next jerk did. So Jeff Stacy got into contact with the setup, as per usual. And his behavior was nothing short of disgusting, as he immediately got down to business. He asked if the setup preferred older partners, and then expressed a desire to, uh bear himself completely, along with a whole laundry list of other disgusting things. And to make things worse, Stacy's behavior didn't stop there. He went one step further and asked how pure the setup was, and also asked if they would sleep with nothing on. He even broached the subject of swallowing his, okay, I'm gonna stop there. I'm sure your imagination can fill in the rest but he wasn't done yet. Later, he explicitly asked if the setup would be willing to get intimate with him. When she mentioned not having a car, Stacy offered to pick her up and do the whole thing right then and there, in the car. 
He even asked how tight she was, too. Yeah, so I hope you're starting to understand why I put this guy on the list. As if this wasn't bad enough, when the setup invited Stacy over, he crossed even more boundaries. As if there were any more left to cross. He first asked if she would answer the door completely exposed. And when she declined, he persisted, requesting that she wait for him in a room with her legs spread apart. I don't think I've ever heard a more disgusting person on the show, honestly. This dude was next level depraved. And he somehow wasn't even done yet, since Stacy attempted to deceive the person further by sending explicit pictures with the heads cropped off, falsely claiming they were of him. And as the cherry on top, despite concerns that the person might be a law enforcement officer, he decided to go ahead and drive over to the sting house anyway. Upon arrival, he found himself face to face with good old Chris Hansen. He initially claimed he came to meet some girl, and it was hilarious to see him try and act so innocent while he had no idea that Chris had all the receipts ready and raring to go. Who'd you come here to meet? Some girl. Some girl whose name is what? You can't even remember her name. It's a man, I believe. He even tried to distance himself from any wrongdoing, insisting he believed she was of legal age because she had told him she was. However, Chris presented him with a chat log and immediately proved him wrong. And right up top, she says she's Okay. Okay. Is that all he could say? So Stacy continued to feign ignorance, downplaying the explicit questions he had asked and claiming they were just casual conversation. He offered explanations for his behavior, all of which were questionable as hell, and even asked why what he had done was illegal in the first place. Only when Chris firmly pointed out the main issue with his actions did Stacy begin to realize the gravity of the situation and offered an apology. That's not what I... If that's what it was, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Stacy's attempts to downplay the explicit pictures he had sent and his intentions with the setup were just so unconvincing. He initially suggested there would be probably a whole lot of nothing happening, but later admitted to considering a kiss or two. Dude. Anyway, he maintained that his actions were just online chatter and didn't reflect who he was in real life, despite sitting in the middle of the sting house in real life. I don't see the internet and real life are two different things. What says on the internet doesn't mean that's what I really think. Chris then challenged Stacy's assertions, pointing out that showing up at the sting house in the first place contradicted his claims. And then it was time for the big reveal. Stacy immediately left the house when confronted with Chris's true identity and a cavalcade of cameras, only to be arrested moments later. Yeah, I don't even know what else to say about this guy. So, how about moving on, huh? But this next loser's confidence went from 100% to zero in no time flat. You see, Dwayne Chrisholm had some pretty high hopes when he showed up at the Sting House. And, well, in just over a day or two, this dude had the audacity to share some really private pictures of himself. Emphasis on private. Not that big. I bet you're a really good lover. Very slow and soft. What's more, he went into excruciating detail about every single thing he wanted to try with the setup. And even reassured her that he'd be very gentle. Not sure if that makes it any better. But I mean, considering the dude was a bodybuilder, it's not surprising he thought he would scare the hell out of her. Anyway, he was more than pleased when the setup called him over. To him, she was just a toy, something to play with and he made sure she understood the dynamics of their encounter almost as soon as he arrived. You go ahead too. Yeah. You wanna come on over? Yep. He actually asked her to sit on his lap. Now, this guy was pretty direct about what he wanted, so would he chicken out when Chris showed up? Turns out, Dwayne was more than just muscles. When Chris asked him if he would have gone all the way with the setup, this is what he had to say. Oh, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't want to say one thing or the other. Yeah, he wasn't sure what would happen himself. Although he said that he wouldn't do anything that she didn't want to, let's not forget the priorities he laid out to her. And if you think that was too much, then wait till you hear what he said when the cameras came out. So, 
When do I get to see myself on TV? I can't believe this guy right now. I mean, did he actually say that? Looks like he found a way to get his 15 minutes of fame, but it's crazy how he wasn't bothered with the consequences, not even when they came knocking. All that was on his mind was when his little rendezvous would hit the screens. We're not gonna do anything to you. Well, sadly for him, this would be his first and last cameo on television. And I hope he got to see the episode from the comforts of his prison cell. William Dow, who went by the screen name Bob75007, also got in contact with yet another person way younger than him. Well, the specifics of their chat log weren't available online, and I mean, after reading all of Stacy's chats, thank God for that, it turns out that Dow admitted he was married during their conversation. What's even more concerning is that Dow proposed the idea of having a girlfriend on the side while he remained married. Maybe I could keep her as a wife and have you for a girlfriend. Classy, right? During their chat, when she mentioned she hadn't been with anyone before, Dow latched onto that little detail and never let go. He told her she could do whatever she wanted during their intimate encounter, suggesting they could explore each other, and described it as a rare opportunity. Yeah, no matter how rare it is, I'm good. Either way, it was clear that the guy was willing to go to any lengths necessary to get with the setup. Like what? Exploring each other. Maybe. <laughs> that would be too much to hope for. However, Dao's conscience began to nag at him, and he grew suspicious, fearing that it might be a sting operation to catch offenders like him, expressing his concerns about getting arrested if he went through with the meeting. Well, you can't say he wasn't self-aware, but the setup played it cool. She managed to dispel that nervousness by bringing up all the things she wanted to do with him. And Dao fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. When he arrived at the location, he was greeted by the person he thought he was meeting, and boy was he delighted. But Dao wasn't keen on staying the night. Out of nowhere, he propositioned the idea of popping out to grab a meal. Well, I thought if we were going to grab something to eat, we can go out and do that. Dow's snack run was soon interrupted, though, when Chris made his entrance and, say it with me now, asked him to take a seat. Caught red-handed, Dow was faced with the uncomfortable question of his intentions. At first, he tried to play it cool, claiming he wanted to take her out for a hamburger. But his facade quickly crumbled when he openly admitted to driving 34 minutes to reach the sting house. But what he said next took the cake. I was stupid. I knew it was a setup. But help me to understand it, if you knew it was a setup. I know, why went I... Yep, he blamed it all on his curiosity. Well, curiosity kills the cat, and Dow's fate was going to be no different. But despite being cornered, Dow, in an attempt to save face, mentioned his profession as a professional horse show photographer. Hey, why didn't you lead with that, buddy? All right, guys, call it off. This guy takes pictures of horses. Anyway... There was one thing that was bothering Dao. Who was this mysterious man confronting him? Dao constantly pressed Chris to reveal his identity, seemingly trying to turn the tables on him. Do you uh, identify yourself? No, I'll get to that in just a minute. No, would you identify yourself now? And when the truth was out in the open, his demeanor changed immediately. When Chris tried to hold him down for another round of questions, Dow rushed towards the door, only to find himself in the custody of the Murphy police. Make the arrest. Dow's actions and reactions in this encounter really got to me. While he may not have been as forward as someone like Stacy, the lengths he went to in order to rationalize his actions was really disturbing. But this next guy put a tremendous amount of effort in just making it to the sting house. Ooh, talk about desperation. Yep, we've got a backpacker in the house. And he probably set the record for the maximum number of lies any weirdo has come up with on the show. I mean, you can't deny that he was a really quick thinker. I'm looking for somebody, and that's all. I'm sorry. And who were you looking for? John Patterson. Right from coming up with random names to excuses that just didn't make any sense, this dude's head was filled with the most nonsensical garbage. But guess what? While most morons jump into the chat room from the comfort and safety of their own homes, this dude chose the public library. Yeah, he just didn't care. That was in a public library. That's what you may know. You don't know everything I know. 
No matter how much Chris tried to break him, JP kept his cool. Only someone who's done this sort of stuff before can boast this level of confidence when confronted. And I guess that pretty much explains how he came up with stuff like this. It was also the computer in, in, in the library used, been, been using my name. Yeah, this excuse has been tried and tested and failed multiple times on the show. That wasn't gonna stop this guy. Now, I'm pretty sure that you can at least name somebody who pulled this same stump before, saying, hey, it wasn't me, it was some random guy using my computer. Now, if you're a big fan of the show, it wouldn't be hard for you to drop at least three or four names in the comments. So I can't understand how this jerk thought Chris was stupid enough to buy his BS. I mean, there was just no stopping him. He went on and on and on. So it's one big mix-up. But despite his best efforts, there were a few plot holes in his story. Not like it mattered to the cops, but it looks like this prick finally gave into the pressure and his brain just shut down. He started jumping from one name to the other. And like this viewer pointed out, he simply lost track of his lives. I guess his hike to the house took a toll on him, mind and body. But this next dude who's making his way into the house right now was a freaking middle school teacher. Sometime in 2006, Stanley Kendall, who went by Stan Mac 12, got in contact with a certain someone, unknowingly playing right into the hands of the Watchdog organization. Like William Dow, the juicy details of their chat aren't available online. But what I do know is that Stanley didn't waste a second before diving headfirst into the explicit deep end. He popped the question, wondering if they could go all the way and if he could play with, uh, certain parts of their bodies. But guess what? Stanley didn't stop there. He started dishing out way too much information about his junk, and even had the audacity to send a picture of it to the setup. But things were about to get weirder. He then had the nerve to ask them to do the same thing. By this point, it was clear that his intentions were anything but innocent. As if the explicit chat wasn't enough, Stanley took it to the next level by suggesting a face-to-face -face meeting. And he'd soon get his wish, but not in the way he hoped. So on November 2nd, he made his way to the meetup spot they agreed on, which just happened to be the first night of the sting operation. And the person he thought he was going to meet greeted him with the legendary line. How you doing, Stanley? Doing good? After some awkward chit chat between the two, Chris made his grand entrance, bringing with him a generous serving of reality. Stanley, in addition to offering his apologies, tried to play it cool. But how he did it was completely mind boggling. Sorry for what? I thought, I thought. Honestly, it's kind of amusing how these guys try to downplay their actions only after they're caught red handed. When Chris asked him how he figured it was a setup, Stanley decided to spill the beans. People that shouldn't be talking to teenagers. People like you. The ironic twist here is that, apparently, he knew it was a trap all along, but showed up anyway. He also dropped the bomb that this was his first time venturing into the world of online meetings. Fantastic news for his potential victims, at least. Oh, and let's not forget what he did for a living. I teach math. And what grade do you teach? Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Six. Yeah. He was a middle school math teacher. It's horrifying to know that in hindsight, since he was spending all day around the type of people he was trying to get close to. But Chris wanted to tighten the noose around Stanley's neck a little more. He went ahead and asked the million dollar question. Had Stanley engaged in similar inappropriate conversations in the past? Well, our guy denied it outright. He also revealed that he had four kids he hadn't seen in ages. And as if that wasn't unexpected enough, he dropped yet another bombshell. A 54-year-old man coming to visit a kid? Of course not. Later, just when you thought he'd run out of ideas to defend himself, he decided to switch gears and talk about religion. Apparently, his Christian side would have frowned upon going all the way. Chris, with a twinkle of humor in his eye, asked if Stanley could find those explicit ideas anywhere in the Bible, be it the Old or New Testament. Hmm, and the poor guy had no answer. Anyway, after one more round of apologies, Stanley decided he'd 
learned his lesson, and solemnly vowed never to venture into a chat room again. But guess what? The grand reveal happened. Chris pulled out the I'm a Dateline NBC reporter card, and the cameras rolled in. Stanley apologized yet again, thanked Chris for the wake-up call, and what he said next was hilarious and baffling at the same time. Helping me with it. I'm an excellent teacher and want to stay that way. The irony isn't lost on me here, believe me. As Stanley made his exit from the house, he was greeted by the long arm of the law. The cops ordered him to hit the deck and then slap the cuffs on him. A search of his car turned up MapQuest directions to the Sting House, solidifying his intent, and also giving me a hell of a blast from the past. Stanley got his close up with the camera, in a much more appropriate way this time thankfully, got booked and was treated to a lovely little interrogation session with the police, all courtesy of his seriously disturbing behavior. <sighs> but this next loser who couldn't even walk in a straight line thought he had what it took to get with the setup. James Wiles was absolutely shameless, no doubt about it. Now, don't let his looks deceive you, cause this dude meant business. Despite his advanced age and visibly fragile physical condition, dude had absolutely no hesitation in expressing his dark desires. Tells the girl he's in love and he quickly hopes the love affair will go to- This old geezer showered the setup with sugary words just to make sure she didn't back out from doing the deed. And what's crazy is that after walking up to the door, dude started getting busy with himself, even before the setup gave him the green light. Seems to telegraph exactly what's on his mind. No words, you guys. Just no words. But this is where his dark intentions came to the surface. When Chris asked him about the chats, Wiles claimed that it was something he did all the time. Don't believe me? Watch for yourselves. You're making all the time I'm there. Okay, cool. With my up your blank. Yeah, not weird at all, huh? And Chris, not Hanson, just a fan in the comments, was 100% on the money. Dude was a hell of a dreamboat. And apparently he was only here to make friends, nothing more. Well, it looks like you're looking for the wrong kind of friendship in the wrong generation and at the completely wrong place, moron. And when Chris asked him if he had any plans to go all the way, his excuse was one of a kind. Oh yeah. I'm past that stage now. Sure you are, buddy. Viewers couldn't stop roasting him, with one stating Wiles looked like he died a thousand times and was resurrected 999 times, and they're not exactly wrong. Either way, physically fit or not, the fact that he propositioned her online was enough to land him in prison, and thank goodness for that. But this next guy had desperation written all over his face. Sheet right there, just put it on. What are you doing here? <laughs> oh yeah, dude was fuming. He couldn't believe what he'd gotten himself into. His reaction was so crazy that Chris actually had to ask him to calm down. While Chris usually goes after most of these guys hard, he applied another approach with Anthony Sorrentino, the eye-rolling moron. In a much calmer tone, Chris asked him what he was up to. And that was what finally broke his silence. For someone who'd been caught red-handed, he wasn't in any position to act like this. I mean, this dude couldn't even open his mouth all the way when he tried to explain himself. We're here to talk. Because I, I, I'm, I just don't think I could have done it anyway. Did you guys hear a thing he said? Because I sure didn't. Now, when I say this dude was desperate, I mean it. He chatted online, talked over the phone for barely two minutes, and 15 minutes later, he was here rolling his eyes at Chris. The guy probably hit a TCAP speedrun world record. All in all, it took him just 30 minutes to go from leading a pretty normal life to facing prison time. He's what the TCAP community calls a fast mover, and said community had a field day with this dude. But at least he didn't bring his friend over like this next weirdo on Hey. Sebastian Rodriguez here thought it would be a good idea to bring some company over. Okay, come right over here, please. Right over there. Yeah. 
Well, it does look like both of them wanted to join in on the fun, but there was a catch. When Chris brought up the setup's age, turns out the tag-along had no idea about it. 12, she said. His face screamed, what the hell did you get me into? Well, it looks like Sebastian forgot to fill him in on a very little, but very important detail. And when things started to get intense, Sebastian started feeling the heat. That right there is the face of a guilty man, one who knew what he did, but wouldn't accept it even if his life depended on it. It's crazy how, despite everything that went down, for some reason, Sebastian thought he would be allowed to walk away scot-free. But that's not the truth, now is it? No. So you just gave it this? Yeah. Am I in trouble, sir? Well, here's the thing, Sebastian. You're already neck deep in trouble. I mean, the conversations they had were just next level nasty. I know where Corona is. It's only an hour away from where I live. I can drive there. Look at him trying to play innocent with that face of his. And meanwhile, the tag along was probably wishing he could disappear. Like he was in some kind of parallel universe. Really, nothing that just came along. It's just a tag along. So. Just a tag along. I really yes. And while this might have been a technique to calm himself down or avoid confrontation, the internet thought otherwise. Some of them joked about how disconnected he was from what was happening. Either way, one thing's for sure the other dude's never gonna take an invite from anyone lightly, ever again. And just so you know, while Sebastian was taken into custody to face the music, Mr. Tagalong walked away, knowing too well that he came very close to ruining his entire life. Last but not least is You Want Come Get Me 2005. Huh, try saying that five times fast. Yeah, that's James Fowler for ya. And the dude was a big, big man. I mean, just look at him towering over the setup here. Look at this, we got these sweet new chairs, sit down. It's so cool. Well, I'm sure the setup had to put on her best act because this dude was pretty intimidating. And to make things worse, he almost immediately made his move on her. S stood up and started heading towards me. Do you want me to get you something to drink? Wow, the nerve on this guy. Dude didn't want to waste any time exchanging pleasantries, I guess. Chris actually had to barge right in to cut him off from chasing the setup into the room. And guess what his first reaction was? You thought this was never gonna happen. You thought this was never gonna happen. Well, sorry bro. It looks like luck wasn't on your side. When Chris whipped out the chat logs, dude was at an absolute loss for words. You like to pleasure people and be pleasured. Yeah. Now you know this is... With no other option left, dude started making those crybaby faces just because he thought Chris would cut him some slack. But you know what? This wasn't his first illicit meetup. Dude was caught doing the same exact thing in the past. And yet, here he was, doing the same thing all over again. Yep. The five, he pleaded guilty. Yes, he didn't learn his lesson. And what's more, he was an ardent follower of the show. I don't know, maybe he was just stupid. But regardless, he was in no hurry to leave the house because he knew what he was walking himself into. Palms, palms, all the way down, all the way down. So those were some of the times when weirdos went way too far on TCAP. Who else do you think should make it to this list? Drop those names in the comments below and I'll definitely come back with another video on the topic. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. And if you thought this video was crazy, then don't forget to check out this next video right here. It's even crazier.